My name is Susan Aronson and I direct this here Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at GW. And we're so pleased to welcome you today. Um, so um, thank you for joining us. And we are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts after the panelists speak. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors at GW, at the Webb Foundation, at Georgetown Law School, and the Internet Society. And it was Dustin Loop of the Internet Society, Washington, DC, who suggested we return to this topic. So today, we're very privileged to have Hillary Brill of Georgetown's Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. She is going to moderate it. And just if I may briefly explain, I have written a lot on data and national security. And I have very strong opinions about this topic. Therefore, I did not feel I could objectively moderate this discussion because I feel passionate about it. So again, I would like to introduce Hillary Brill, who is the interim director of Georgetown's Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that introduction and the opportunity. Thank you for your strong opinions, because now I feel fortunate that I get to be here today with these esteemed panelists and talk about this exciting issue at Georgetown's Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy, I guess on that side. Uh, we bring together academics, thought leaders, journalists, uh, folks like today to talk about issues at the intersection of law and policy. And there are a few topics like today's topic, which brings up national security issues, it brings up privacy issues, it brings up First Amendment issues, and clearly digital trade and uh, political ramifications around the world. And I love the top, the title that you chose about the saga of TikTok and WeChat, because this is a saga. It has all the great parts of a great book or a great movie, or dare I say a Netflix um, series. We've got a stock character of the president, we have a threat from a communist country, and then we have innocent teenagers using an app constantly and adults and other people as well. And is there something nefarious? Is there some kind of underpinning that we don't know about? I can almost hear the soundtrack behind us, but this isn't fiction. This is our real, real life. And this is what's going on. And the unbanning and banning of TikTok has raised these very, very serious questions. And our panelists are going to talk about this some more. So let me um, get right to it. Anna Swanson, you uh, write about trade and international um, economics for the New York Times. You previously covered the economy, trade, and Federal Reserve for the Washington Post, among many other things. Can you please set the stage for the, the viewers today, explain a bit about what this saga is and where we are? In fact, uh, just yesterday, there was some movement um, to reban. Uh, TikTok with the government. So it's ongoing. Please uh, set the stage for us. Absolutely. And I do agree. This has been quite a saga. It's been very dramatic. The only problem is that we don't know exactly how the story ends yet. So it's kind of unsatisfying. Um, but let me give you a quick background. I'll try to be brief because there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, but first, we'll talk about two apps here. So one is TikTok, which is a viral video platform that has a lot of American users, about 100 million active users a month in the United States. Um, and we'll also talk about WeChat, um, which is more of an all-purpose communication app um, you know, for chatting, for news, for um, it has a payment function owned by the Chinese company Tencent. And that has a smaller user base in the United States, about 20 million daily users. But it's really vital for uh, the Chinese American community here that, to communicate with China. Um, we first heard about an investigation into TikTok's acquisition of some American assets. Um, by CFIUS, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which examines um, mergers for national security concerns uh, late last year. And then earlier this year, TikTok landed on the Trump administration's radar when a group of kids bought out a bunch of tickets at a Trump rally, which inflated their expectations for the event and resulted in a lot of um, empty seats and was kind of embarrassing. In August, the president then decided that he wanted to make an example of these two services, and he issued twin executive orders banning TikTok and WeChat from carrying out commercial transactions in the United States after a period of 45 days if they weren't acquired by an American company first. And for that, he relied on the International Emer Emergency Economic Powers Act, 
um, which gives the president broad powers to respond to unusual and extraordinary threats and which some in the administration have kind of seen as a blank check when it comes to national security concerns. Um, the administration didn't actually immediately define what constituted a commercial transaction so it created a lot of uncertainty for the business community people didn't know if you know the app would be removed from app stores but people would still be able to have it on their phones or if starbucks would still be able to use wechat to process payments in china and um, so there was a lot of you know many weeks of confusion for the business community on this front um, and that deadline also set off a race for uh, TikTok in particular to be acquired um, Microsoft was an early contender to purchase it, but it soon became clear that the administration favored a different bid by um, Oracle, the software maker, and Walmart. And then in the midst of all this, China also placed export controls on TikTok's algorithm, implying that the Chinese government could intervene if it wanted to to scuttle a potential deal. Um, so the Oracle bid um, may be less defensible from a national security perspective. We can talk about that more later. But Oracle has simply offered to become a technology partner for the company and um, is not going to be acquiring its algorithm. Um, but Oracle also happens to have very close ties with the Trump administration uh, conveniently. So as I understand it right now, uh, CFIUS is still reviewing that proposal. Things have gone sort of quiet in the meantime. I think you know everyone's happy to be out of the limelight um, for a few weeks until the next deadline, which um, I believe is November 12th that the Trump executive order gives until uh, TikTok to find a suitor. Um, and there's also a lot of litigation right now uh, in the cases. Um, the Commerce Department was poised to go ahead with this ban on WeChat, but both of the bans on TikTok and WeChat have been challenged in court and judges have issued temporary um, injunctions against their enforcement. So for now, both apps are still available in the United States. Um, and some of those arguments in court revolve around the administration's national security rationale being weak. Um, in WeChat's case, there's also an argument that this in particular violates First Amendment rights. Um, the government has appealed in these cases. It's not clear what the outcome will be. Um, so one question I was asked to address is, is this going to create greater security for the personal data of Americans? I'm sure the other panelists will have great perspectives on this as well. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of, you know, uncertainties about some of the national security threats surrounding these services, but I would say, you know, overall, it's kind of um, doubtful how much uh, these bans will do to protect security for the personal data of Americans. Um, there are two basic concerns the collection of personal data and influence or censorship by China. And on data collection with TikTok in particular, the administration hasn't released much persuasive uh, information about its concerns. There could be more classified information, but what it's put out publicly doesn't seem particularly persuasive. Um, for WeChat, I do think there is a case to make about censorship and influence um, because the Chinese government does have a lot of control over what appears on that platform globally. Um, but as I mentioned, it's also a really vital channel of communication for Chinese Americans. So by banning it, um, you're giving up quite a lot as well. Um, so that's my brief overview. I hope that helps to set the stage for our conversation. Uh, thank you, Anna. It really does. You can tell that it, it I mean, you've explained how it involves litigation, it involves economics, it involves trade, it involves security, and, and there are many different nuances and layers. We don't have time, unfortunately. We only have a half hour to um, have our speakers address questions, and then we have a half hour open to the audience where if you can see the Q&A at the bottom and you're thinking as you hear, please put in a Q&A at the bottom. But there's so much there that I wanna, wanna get into, and I'm sure some other folks might ask the same questions. So I'm gonna go um, to Professor Gao, uh, who is uh, an associate professor of law at Singapore Management University, and um, you are also at the Shanghai Institute of Foreign Trade. You have law degrees from three continents, so congratulations on that alone. Um, you start, it was hard enough to do it here in the US. You have it in three different continents. You started your career as the first Chinese lawyer at the WTO Secretariat, so we're very fortunate to have your geopolitical perspective here on the issues uh, involved with national security, with politicizing trade, with politicizing TikTok and WeChat. Uh, can you talk to us about these international implications and recent 
I mean, very recent, just uh, this week activity with uh, WTO that appears to be an immediate ramification. Can you please uh, enlighten us more um, from your perspective? Sure, thank you, Hilary, and uh, thanks to Susan too for inviting me to this exciting event. So I will start by uh, discussing a little bit of China's reactions, which Anna touched upon briefly uh, a bit just now. Uh, as she mentioned, China uh, introduced immediately these new rules on export control, uh, which revised China's catalog of export prohibited and restricted technologies on August 28th, right after the U.S. announced the restrictions on TikTok. So it prohibits the uh, export of technologies, including uh, personalized information push services based on data analysis, which is exactly what TikTok is doing. So if you have ever used TikTok, you will know that after you review a video, they will show you the next video, which is based on what you have reviewed so far. So uh, if you, uh, you know, read on the Chinese uh, uh, web, uh, people are saying that um, uh, TikTok uh, algorithm is something like a magic or holy grail app that is uh, tested with the data of 1.4 billion Chinese people. And we should not just let the Americans get this algorithm and then use it uh, to somehow uh, uh, steal our uh, 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 advanced technology or even state secrets. So as you can see, China is a totally different focus here. For the US, the Uh, uh, problems with uh, people, you know, uh, making videos around the military base and so on. But for China, they are really concerned with the algorithm. They do not want to give up the algorithm. So that is why that is made a condition. And that is why TikTok, as I understand, is applying to the Chinese government for uh, approval to export uh, this technology to the U.S. And another recent development is this unreliable entity list, which the Chinese government just introduced a month ago. Now, this is supposed to target foreign entities that adopt discriminatory measures against or terminate normal transactions with Chinese firms. So according to the rules, if you terminate your transaction with TikTok or WeChat, as required by the uh, two executive orders, you will be put on China's uh, uh, unreliable entity list. So this would really put many companies between a rock and a hard place. You have to choose literally between the US or China. So what are the implications for the rest of the world? I, I think more countries are going to follow suit. Uh, there's a very recent survey by the Pew Center, which shows increasingly negative uh, uh, reviews on China by the major countries in the world. So I, I, I think the next country is going to follow suit is definitely the five eyes, and maybe other countries such as Brazil and uh, Europe will also uh, follow uh, suit uh, uh, very shortly. But then uh, this will not stop China from expanding its reach in the Belt and Road Initiative countries, you know, all these uh, uh, Asia, uh, Africa, Middle Eastern countries, so which are really keen for Chinese firms like Huawei to help them to build the uh, technological infrastructure, especially the telecom uh, networks. Uh, in terms of the broader implications on trade, I, I think uh, this is going to cause some really serious uh, doubt on whether uh, a phase two agreement is even possible. Uh, and uh, this is also going to raise some doubts uh, regarding China's continued participation in the WTO e-commerce joint statement initiative negotiations. Now, uh, China already tried to uh, deal with some of these issues, actually, in its latest submissions. Its latest submissions was made a year ago, last September uh, 2019, where it mentioned uh, 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 an article called Electronic Commerce Related Network Equipment and Products. And these uh, basically refer to uh, the uh, countries blocking the supply chains of electronic commerce related network equipment and products, including both uh, the material components, parts and software and technologies. Initially, uh, it was really designed for Huawei, you know, to deal with the Huawei sanctions. But I think because it also mentioned software and technologies, so potentially this Chinese proposal could also have some major implications on TikTok and WeChat. And I expect China to uh, also emphasize on these provisions uh, in the negotiations. Uh, and I understand that the U.S. is not very happy with this provision. So it will be interesting to see how this uh, uh, play out. And another latest development I understand is that the U.S. has indicated that they are going to 
also impose similar restrictions on, uh, for example, and financial, uh, you know, which is the major payment service that is uh, that has enabled uh, a sense like Taobao and Alibaba. And China also addressed this in its uh, WTO e-commerce negotiation proposal. Uh, one of the main focuses of the Chinese proposal is on services directly supporting trading goods, such as payment and logistics services. So this would be, for example, and financial and all these uh, courier services, which China used to help its uh, e-commerce giants. So I, I, I think China definitely is going to double up uh, on these, uh, all these uh, uh, issues in the WTO. Now, uh, some people also mentioned the possibility of a WTO dispute, uh, China bring a WTO dispute uh, against the US. But I, I have to caution here that it's not so easy to build a case under the WTO because the agreement most likely uh, to bring an under would be the general agreement on trading services or the gas. And it's very hard to build a case and a guess because first of all, you have to make sure that the specific sector and subsector is included in your schedule. And second, you have to make sure that the other party has included the particular mode of supply. And third, you have to make sure that in this mode of supply, the other party has made no restrictions on national treatment and also on market access. And uh, uh, also you have to make sure that they cannot cite to one of the two uh, exceptions clauses, general exception and security exception. So it is very hard to bring case, which uh, probably explains why, for example, 10 years ago, when Google was driven out of China, actually I understand that the USTR was considering bringing a case against China. And in the end, they did not bring a case, uh, probably because they discovered that it's very hard to nail down China in WTO according to its uh, guest schedule of commitments. Now, uh, with regard to the security exception, which I think uh, uh, if a case ever materialized in the WTO, is the most likely exception that the US would uh, 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 cite. But uh, uh, if you look at the recent jurisprudence of the WTO, like, uh, for example, the Russian transit case, you can see that the panel has uh, tried to kind of narrow the scope of this exception. Uh, by saying that even though uh, the policy goal for what is uh, national security is uh, defined by the country itself, but you cannot relabel trade interests that uh, you have agreed to protect and promote within the system as essential security interests. Now, this is a pure dicta, but I think the panel was talking about the US-China trade war. And also the panel also said uh, elsewhere in the panel report that if you only have political and economic differences between countries, these are not sufficient of themselves to constitute an emergency in international relations for purposes of the security exception. So it would be very hard for the US to justify such exceptions and the security exception. So I, I think a WTO case would be hard actually for both sides. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gao. That was an excellent, <clears throat> excuse me, that was an excellent summary of the issues and uh, international, excuse me, <clears throat> perspective. And uh, I'm, I'm going to move directly to Professor Chander to give you an opportunity to speak. Um, Professor Chander, uh, you are a Georgetown Law Professor. You are an expert on global regulation of new technologies. And you have served on the World Economic Forum, expert groups on digital economy. You also are an outspoken um, professor on this issue. And uh, we're, we thank you for being here today. Um, I want to first talk about actually national security issues. And uh, national security issues are important. And we're talking about uh, motivations here behind going after TikTok or going after WeChat, but there can be national legitimate concerns and they shouldn't be lightly dismissed, nor should they be frankly politicized. And it's important to address privacy and security concerns inherent with any app to ensure that consumers are safe and informed about their digital rights. Is there some other type of motivation here because it's TikTok and WeChat? Uh, what about the national security concerns and how should we balance these uh, different competing tensions and different competing influences? Great. Well, first of all, thanks, Susan, uh, for the invitation. Thanks, Hillary, for uh, superb moderation, as always. And I'm honored to be on a panel with Anna and Henry. Um, Henry wrote the classic piece on the case that the United States might 
bring a, 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 with respect to the, ban, the Great Firewall of China. Uh, and so now it is an awkward position that the United States finds itself in to be using China's arguments in such a case to defend itself, essentially, if such a case were brought. So we have borrowed the Chinese playbook, um, and we have, in that sense, kind of uh, eroded our claim to moral leadership for an open internet, one that tries to ensure security and transparency and privacy and consumer protection uh, across the world. Um, and um, Henry's point where the Chinese press is uh, concerned about compelled technology transfer from China to the United States should make us all feel a little embarrassed um, because that's the argument that we make against China repeatedly uh, and to be put. Uh, so the other argument in this context is, um, oh, turnabout is fair, fair play. Uh, so, but really we've always, uh, ad adopted the position as a, a, as a real, really kind of uh, liberal uh, leader uh, for in in the world that we don't adopt the tactics of our of of our competitors. We we have a you know a, a a code that I think is important, and we are sacrificing our position in that in that way. So as you can see, I am outspoken on these issues because I think it's critical that we not cede this this ground, that we continue to press for a, a global and open internet, uh, which really has uh, you know advantages for uh, expression, for uh, economic development, for for the people across the world. Um, and we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't sacrifice that. Now, turning to your question, Hillary, uh, more directly, uh, the national security uh, implications here. Uh, so I, I wanted to make two quick observations on, on that point. Uh, first, um, it's important to remember that a federal judge appointed by President Trump reviewed the secret evidence that the government offered against TikTok and yet ruled in favor of the app. And so I'm glad to see that the federal judiciary is carefully scrutinizing executive action with significant impact on speech, not cowed by assertions of national security threats. Um, Henry has already told you that the WTO um, is uh, it will review issues of national security, uh, even if there is an exception. There, there are ways that the WTO uh, is suggesting that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, commonplace assertions of national security are not magic words that can then immunize you from legal review. And I think that's true in the United States as well. U.S. courts should not uh, just simply uh, accept any claim for national security. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that our uh, main uh, partners across the world, um, with the exception of India, have not banned the app. The European Union governments have not banned TikTok or WeChat. Uh, and so, you know, it is, it is uh, if it is banned in, in countries like India and now yesterday Pakistan, um, it's for other reasons. Um, in the context of India, uh, it was seen as a digital strike in response to a kinetic uh, battle uh, in the Himalayas. Uh, and so not really the standard national security uh, based uh, uh, assessment of the real threat that it posed, but rather a kind of tit for tat response um, it, to avoid uh, further inflaming a kinetic battle. Uh, and so I think here, we should be also cautious that um, national security is always used by governments to protect themselves and then uh, has often been used by uh, governments to assume greater powers. Um, this is how authoritarian governments come into power and maintain their power by asserting national security interests against, uh, against foreign entities. In this case, I think the national security interests have been overblown. There are national security interests with all apps. Um, the, the fact that uh, we are using a variety of apps with uh, terrible data management practices leaves that information open to siphoning off by lots of malevolent actors. 
you don't have to be a government to grab it directly. You can grab it from uh, third party hackers who can, or third parties uh, brokers. Um, and so there's lots of ways to get the data of Americans or other people who use apps. And we need to address those questions and improve that. And I think that's what, Su you know, when Susan talks about having strong uh, uh, opinions on these issues, I think that's what she's getting at. Uh, we need a better global system to protect data uh, and, uh, and ensure security across the world. Thank you, Professor Chander. You know, from listening to all of you, it's interesting to just really think about the fact that this does come down to the algorithm, as uh, Professor Gao said. And I think one of our audience members who um, also agreed, saying, yes, it comes down to the algorithm and it's important and who owns it and who does what. It's just incredible that an algorithm has brought all of us together and basically many people, uh, the government, um, and it's in, I don't want to say it to its knees, but in a way, um, trying to figure out all of these important issues of what do we do about privacy and security. There are greater issues than just TikTok and WeChat and put aside your issues of whether you like TikTok or whether you think it's um, causing um, a joy to the world or causing harm, whatever you think of TikTok, there are greater issues here involved. And it is important for uh, our judges and the appropriate um, administrators to actually look at what the actual threats are here for any type of app. And thank you for that perspective on, on where it is. I do want to ask you all, because I have a few more minutes before our audience, and again, audience, please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, I kind of feel like I know your answer, and, I, and I'm going to put you on the spot, but to ban or not to ban, I mean, that at the end of the day, do we ban TikTok? Um, and maybe before you answer it personally, let you heard it here first. What's your prediction on um, what the what the courts in the U.S. might do? So, uh, Professor Jennifer, better or worse, no one can see you. I see you shaking your head. So, just like any good professor would pick someone who is looking at me, I'm going to let you go first. Um, so. Um... Uh, I think it's clear that I think we, the app should not be banned. Uh, neither app should be banned. I think, uh, as Anna pointed out, they raise different concerns, um, and they're you know, um, and WeChat is used also domestically within the United States to communicate among uh, Chinese speaking, largely Chinese speaking uh, communities. So it's a, it's a you know, important app even in the United States for for communication. Um, but um, with respect to the prediction. I actually think that there's a fairly good chance. So the DC uh, District Court had um, a statutory reading that foreclosed the government's action, and the uh, the Northern District of California District Court had a constitutional reading that foreclosed the action. And you only need one basis to foreclose the action, and there are a handful of uh, you know possible bases on which uh, appellate courts could could side with TikTok uh, or WeChat users. And I, and I suspect that they, the courts will affirm those decisions, the preliminary injunctions. And as I said, in the, in the DC district court, the judge is a Trump appointee, a longstanding member of the Federal Society, who, cite, who after reviewing the secret evidence said that the Trump administration's ban sh would likely lose in the courts and that he only reviewed the statutory claim, but that the other claims presented were also posed, quote, serious questions. So I think um, all of that should, should give pause to the Trump administration. And I'm actually surprised they took the appeal because the likelihood that they lose twice, um, they've lost twice already and they lose again, um, it, it will diminish IEPA, uh, which I think is important to diminish, uh, but it will reduce executive power um, in the uh, future interpretations. So there's much more beyond just uh, the TikTok and WeChat. I mean, there's a whole question of what happens to the next national security threat uh, and, and um, relation here. So, so that's true. All right, I have to ask, uh, uh, Anna, what, what, what is, go ahead. Um, sure, definitely. So, um, I mean, a lot of experts I've spoken to make a persuasive case that we don't need a ban. We need a more comprehensive approach, um, like some of the speakers mentioned so far. Um, you know, I think what would be great is if this incident could start a broader conversation about protecting American data. Um, you know, this is a very piecemeal approach so far that the Trump administration has taken. 
um, you know, why go after TikTok and why not, you know, Alibaba or other Tencent services? Why not services, uh, you know, run by different countries outside of China? So I think there are very, you know, potential legitimate security concerns about data collection and censorship and influence here. But, um, you know, just banning uh, certain apps one by one doesn't do much to address it. Um, a ban, you know, does eliminate some national security concerns, but it comes at a really high cost. Uh, it sets certain standards um, for the United States actions globally. Um, it has potentially, you know, First Amendment ramifications in the United States, cutting Chinese Am Americans off from, you know, communication globally. Um, so I think we do really need to have that, you know, broader conversation instead of a ban about what we need to do to protect American data. And that conversation really hasn't, you know, has barely even started, I feel like, in the, in the public sphere. And part of the reason is that the US is really home to some of the world's largest internet firms. And unlike Europe, we've been kind of reluctant to regulate them too heavily or really begin to talk about that more comprehensive approach. Thank you, Anna. And Professor Gao. Yes, Hillary. What is your opinion? Do you think that uh, uh, TikTok should be banned? Do you want to? Uh, tell us here, or are you not sure yet? Well, um, I mean, this is a difficult question because uh, I guess among all panelists, I'm probably the only person who uses both TikTok and WeChat, you know. So <laughs> that's, uh, I have to make this a disclaimer first, you know, that's a bit of a personal interest at stake. I mean, uh, my approach is uh, a bit nuanced. I, I, I think there are certain aspects of the apps uh, like uh, animation, you know, like a censorship, you know, which make it not so uh, pleasing. But I, I do not think that we should throw out the baby together with the bathwater because uh, 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 there are ways to make, uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, external, uh, you know, uh, non-Chinese uh, versions of TikTok and uh, uh, WeChat different from the Chinese version. And we all understand that, uh, you know, within China, uh, the WeChat app engage in extensive censorship. But I think what the US government could do is to ask uh, WeChat to make a, a, a uncensored version uh, available outside of China, you know, and the TikTok could do the same. And that uh, would solve the problem. And uh, that uh, would also, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of solve some of the uh, concerns and to address the uh, the security uh, concerns, so we could borrow some of the language from some of the free trade agreements that the U.S. has signed into. For example, uh, in uh, many of the recent U.S. Uh, trade agreements, they've included this provision, which says uh, the government should have uh, a immediate and uh, uh, ongoing and unlimited access to the data uh, that uh, um, the firms uh, have access to. For example, uh, this is same in the financial services uh, uh, sector, but we could expand this to other sectors like TikTok and WeChat. So long as the government has, uh, you know, immediate and ongoing and unlimited access to the data of WeChat and uh, TikTok, so, uh, so that when something happens, the government can immediately take action. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, we would need really a, a total ban. Instead, uh, uh, we can allow it to, to keep uh, ringing while uh, the government can use this to uh, alleviate the security concerns. Thank you. And you're correct. You have a perspective that um, we're fortunate to have and share using both of those apps because people here talk so much about TikTok, but WeChat is so integral to what um, so many people in uh, China use, right? On their I just, I just want to, I just want to say that Henry, I am your friend on WeChat, so I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, we don't have enough time to ask, but I am so curious to know what you're doing on TikTok and have you posted, but that's for an after conversation, right? I'd love to know. I, I can understand what you're doing on WeChat, but I'd love to know what you're doing on TikTok. Well, um, I'm going to go right to the question and um, the questions that the audience has posed uh, for you so that we can get some audience uh, interaction here. Um, I'm going to read, um, and I apologize if I'm saying your name's wrong, so I'm gonna try, I think it's Timon um, Amarani. How do you believe that a possible Biden administration would deal with the TikTok WeChat bans? And there's a second part. 
but also deal in general with data privacy and regulation of big tech companies. Who wants to take that first? Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, I can just um, just quickly with the first part of the question. So they haven't actually clarified their position on the TikTok WeChat bans, um, but I think they've made clear that they think the Trump administration's approach is kind of erratic um, and that they want to take an approach that's um, more comprehensive, that works much more closely with American allies. So I think that, you know, they've been very skeptical of this kind of action, but they haven't actually come forward and said yet that they would, um, you know, withdraw that ban if it does go into effect. Um, you know, maybe if it's in um, litigation, they would just kind of let that, you know, continue, that injunction continue. Um, I think we have to see really what their position is on it um, yet. And I'll let some of the other um, experts on the panel uh, answer uh, the next question. I mean, I think, you know, they are looking at, um, in general more uh you know much more intensive kind of regulation of big tech companies and there's a lot of interest from congress in that but i think some of our other panelists might have more details i think that sounds exactly right the biden administration has not made its views um i'm sorry the <laughs> sorry the biden um uh campaign has not made its views on what it would do should uh, should uh, Vice President Biden win the, pre uh, the presidency. But I do think that uh, this erratic approach, as uh, Anna described it, is one that they would disfavor. And I could easily see a kind of, um, uh, if a ban went into effect, uh, the ban being withdrawn. Um, it's, it's possible to revive an app. Uh, and I would think that in this, you know, the fact that um, TikTok has copies of the data in Singapore may actually turn out to be critical in this context to revive the app if it were, uh, if it, the, it was ordered, all the data was ordered to be deleted in the United States. Um, but um, uh, so I do think that um, I, I can't imagine that the Biden administration would, would um, approach, would, uh, would, would stand by the Trump administration's approach, would seem highly politicized. Um, rather than uh, uh, principled. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Chander. Uh, we have a question from Sam DuPont that says, setting aside issues of national security, what about trade reciprocity? Uh, he takes your point. He says, I take Professor Chander's point that the US has historically modeled openness to good effect. And obviously, we can't block Chinese services without implicating our WTO commitments. But surely the answer isn't, and I'm quoting him, but surely the answer isn't that we permanently accept a status quo where US services are blocked in China and Chinese services operate freely in the US. So it's clearly correct. But the question is how you address that issue. And we have been working on increasing trade liberalization. China is actually it is opening up in a variety of ways. The financial industry is, you know, been granted greater access. For example, you're seeing, you know, uh, Tesla go in without a joint venture. Uh, there's a lot of things that are changing on the ground. Uh, and this particular uh, decision, which is in the heat of an election campaign, to compel something to be to be sold in 45 days um, or transferred in, in nine, you know, in nine, 45 or 90 days, depending on which executive order you're looking at, um, is not the way to go about any principled response to that uh, scenario. Uh, I've been refinancing our house and uh, with the same bank that originally loaned us the money, and that's taken longer than the sale of a, of a firm that may be, you know, worth in the tens and tens of billions of dollars. Any other takers? Uh, uh, um, yeah, I can just jump in quickly. So um, I do think, you know, there's an interesting case to make about reciprocity, obviously, because um, a lot of you American services have been banned in China for a long time. Um, you know, interestingly, the administration actually hasn't talked a lot about reciprocity from what I've heard. Um, and, you know, I think, um, when you're thinking about what the effects of this approach have been, I mean, you can just look at, you know, have these bans so far 
um, you know, caused other governments to kind of double down on this approach of banning other services, or are they actually an effective way to get China to um, to remove some of their restrictions on American products. And so far, you know, China hasn't responded to these bans by lifting the Great Firewall. They've responded by introducing a new unreliable entity list, which would crack down on American uh, companies. So I, I think what you're seeing is that these bans, you know, ag are actually resulting in more tit for tat um, trade action, which, you know, overall places more restriction on uh, international data flows and commerce, not less. Um, I do think there's a really persuasive case to be made for some kind of action that would encourage China to lift, you know, lift or roll back the, the Great Firewall. I'm not sure if that would succeed, but an action like that, you know, you'd probably have to undertake it with our allies in order to get enough um, uh, momentum and uh, ability to put pressure on, on China. Yeah, uh, and maybe I can also chip in. Uh, so I, I think the discussion about reciprocity in the context of a service liberalization is a bit misdirected because uh, uh, services agreement is unlike trade agreement. Uh, I mean, uh, we understand that uh, uh, the a step to take for services is what we would call progressive liberalization. We do not expect that all members liberalize all services sectors overnight. So if you look at the WTO members in general, out of a total of more than 160 subsectors uh, for services, on average, developed countries would uh, liberalize more than 120 subsectors, while development countries would only liberalize 60 subsectors. So China actually already liberalized more than most developing countries by liberalizing more than 100 subsectors. So that is already a good start. And uh, the second thing I, I think in terms of uh, trying to address this uh, reciprocity, uh, reciprocity issue, uh, even we, if we admit that, that the issue uh, exists, is not really to start banning Chinese uh, uh, apps because uh, an eye for an eye will leave the world bland, as people would like to say, you know. So if the U.S. is really concerned with the lack of access to the Chinese market, they should start uh, with the same vigor to try to push for China to open up to all these U.S. apps and websites like Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, and so on, rather than closing the door to Chinese apps on the U.S. side, because then that would be a Lose lose situation rather than win win situation. So so I, I think all these efforts are totally misdirected. Uh, had the U.S. been uh, you know using 50 percent of the effort it has used in blocking TikTok and WeChat in trying to push the Chinese government to open up to Google and Facebook, I think we would all be in a much better world. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I want to get to some of the questions that we have many of them and thank you for putting them in the Q&A. Um, this question uh, actually builds on um, uh, Professor Aronson's work on uh, or raises questions of data as a development issue. And Jonathan asks, you know, how does this saga, he uses our term saga, impact trade agreements and middle powers who cannot compete globally without access to the algorithms produced by China and the U.S.? How does this affect other countries? You know, we're clearly talking about the U.S. and China, but uh, what are the implications on other countries that aren't as powerful as U.S. and China? And you touched on that a little in your last question, I mean, in your last answer, Professor Gao. Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I think I know Paul might have something to say, uh, but my take is that uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, w what we are seeing is the rise of the so-called splinter net, you know, yeah. where the whole uh, internet, uh, the whole World Wide Web, which we regard it as uh, one internet, uh, uh, become fragmented, where you will see the rise of uh, the American version of the internet, the Chinese version of the internet, and also possibly the European version of the internet. And uh, these countries all have to choose, you know, so uh, whether they choose to use, let's say, Facebook or WeChat, uh, whether they choose to use Google or Badu, you know, so I, I, I would say the, uh, the world is uh, uh, being divided up like that, which is really unfortunate because, as I said earlier, I, I would like to live in a world where everybody can use the everybody else app, right? Uh, so that uh, that would uh, uh, help to harness the data that we have as uh, the common 
uh, 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 resources uh, the, uh, uh, of mankind rather than to divide up uh, the limited resource we have uh, available. So, so I, I would say that uh, it's very unfortunate that for all these countries, they have to choose. Uh, and I, I hope that one day we could return to a world where we uh, you know, can use whatever app that we, we, we choose. And actually there's uh, such a principle already in the WTO, the so-called technology and neutrality principle. I mean, the idea is that uh, you as a user should not be forced to, to, to uh, choose between different technologies, to for, be forced to use a specific technology. I mean, this could be, uh, this logic could be extended even to app. We as users can, should be able to choose the app that we uh, want to use for certain purposes, rather than being forced with a specific app, even if we don't like it. So let me pick up on, oh, sorry, Anna. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick here. So, so I, you know, I do agree that there is this kind of phenomenon of the, the splinter net, right? Um, and, um, you know, there are some, on, of course, ongoing discussions surrounding data at the WTO um, for more of a multilateral approach approach, but the models of the US, the EU, and China are extremely powerful and influential. And a lot of smaller countries are being put in a position where they're choosing to follow various models, but sometimes left in a tough spot. And I was just going to bring up that um, the other week I was actually on another panel with um, Susan talking about some of these issues. Um, and one of the panelists brought up a really interesting case of Canada, which has accepted um, some US data rules through the new USMCA trade agreement. Um, has accepted other rules through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and is also signing on um, to uh, Europe's GDPR. But now there are questions about whether those systems of rules are compatible within Canada, you know? So in some ways, smaller countries are really left in a kind of untenable position by these, um, you know, battling greater powers. So I agree that the splinter net is uh, very much upon us. And um, what we're going to see is uh, this example being used to ban more apps. And it's not just going to be Chinese apps. It's going to be American apps that will be, be targeted. So the rationale of, this, of this, these apps, it can easily be applied to American apps. You may recall the Snowden revelations. Those revelations may have been forgotten in the United States, but they have not been forgotten across the world, uh, especially because the revelations sometimes revealed, you know, the, um, the surveillance of Angela Merkel's cell phone uh, or the, you know, the leadership of, of, uh, of uh, Brazil uh, or Brazilian corporations. So all of that is going to, and so you already saw yesterday the banning of TikTok um, in, so before we had seen blocks, um, but now outright bans is uh, becoming much more, uh, much more likely. And so I think we're going to see an increasing kind of, um, you know, erosion of a global internet, uh, and that is not going to be helpful for anyone. Uh, Professor Tanner, that plays upon a question that was asked by um, uh, Philip Thompson about is this, are these bands of Pandora's box? Are there going to be now other partners in um, like the EU that are now going to, you know, ban maybe Facebook, maybe Twitter? Possible. So, so certainly there are people in the EU who really would just like Facebook to be shuttered. Um, and so, um, you know, you can imagine, so there, there are many in the EU um, who would like uh, Facebook to entirely localize its data. Uh, and I'm not even sure what it means for a social network to localize data. That's um, another issue, they, right? They really do not have any friends in the United States. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so in any case, uh, so all of that is, is, is troubling. Um, and I think it's, it's very much going to be in a Pandora's box that the United States has, uh, has opened uh, in a very unhelpful way. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I just wanted to point out also that, um, you know, the Trump administration is um, arguing against this kind of piecemeal regulation of technology companies on other fronts too. So, um, you know, arguing against, for example, the kinds of digital services taxes that have been introduced against American technology companies um, in Europe and in other countries. 
And um, so there's really a potential for this kind of regulation to, you know, rebound negatively on the United States and other fronts as well, where we want to, you know, preserve a more global um, internet on behalf of our, our business interests. I've been reading the questions and we don't have time to get to um, all of them. And it's just interesting that there are many different issues involved here. And, and many times um, the issues can get convoluted. There are lots of questions about motivations um, behind what's happening. There are questions about uh, issues that are related to how Facebook is potentially um, uh, influencing the elections. You know, what do we do about that? And there are issues about abuse um, with these uh, apps and those those issues exist and 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 they're worth discussing but this is an issue about not like how would you separate that from from those or is it even possible to separate i i was gonna put my opinion but i'm the moderator how would you guys separate and what should we really be focusing on when we talk about this ban and unbanning of TikTok and WeChat? and maybe you can't separate them So let me begin the conversation. So I think we do need a global approach. Um, the European Union has signaled through the European Court of Justice uh, unhappiness with data transfers to the United States. Uh, we're signaling uh, unhappiness with data transfers to China. Uh, and we may see a lot more of this kind of activity across the world as the global internet becomes, uh, you know, the global web becomes uh, torn apart. Uh, and so what we need to do is uh, reassure people, create legal systems that protect rights across the world. Your data, the internet doesn't itself know boundaries. The boundaries have to be uh, engrafted upon on a technological infrastructure that wasn't designed for it, except in China, where that, the technological infrastructure was built with those boundaries um, from the, from the get-go, essentially. Um, but uh, but uh, I think we want to avoid the, the outcome that China has produced, and the United States sh should again, play a leading role in this. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the European GDPR is an important contribution to the dialogue, but it's not the, it doesn't resolve a lot of these questions um, in and of itself. Uh, and so, and it's, uh, its data transfer regime is ultimately also highly politicized, um, though, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been described that way, but the data adequacy system remains highly politicized. And we're seeing this in, in the negotiations uh, with Brexit, where uh, Britain now w may become an untrusted partner for European data, simply because it leaves the union, um, even if it has the exact same laws that it had the day before that it was once a member of the European Union. Uh, so, uh, so you know, all this is happening and we need a better system that's depoliticized um, and that is, uh, that is focused on protecting data and, and privacy and people, not protecting political interests of various parties. Any other takers? Professor Gao? Yes, thank you, Hilary. I fully agree with uh, Anna Pong that we really need a, a global approach to deal with uh, many of these issues, uh, such as, uh, you know, free flow of data, uh, such as uh, data privacy, and also censorship issues. I think there need to be global rules rather than leaving it to each country to uh, 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 kind of a craft their own uh, rules because uh, uh, we already seen the uh, you know bad results of such an approach where uh, countries learn from each other and they do not learn from the good examples of each other they tend to learn from the bad examples of each other you know so uh, a, a global approach really uh, can help that and in this regard I think the WTO e-commerce GSI negotiation uh, would be a good start but uh, uh, that itself uh, uh, is uh, not enough because there are many issues that probably cannot be uh, solved in the uh, GSI negotiation because of the limitations on the original mandate and also the scope and uh, the membership. So that more needs to be done. Uh, and I think that we really need to explore many different ways. And uh, if I may, uh, you know, uh, end my intervention with a more uh, brighter, 
uh, uh, Outlook, uh, actually, as of today, I just discovered that there's a, this new app in China, which is called Cuba Browser, which allows you to uh, browse the Google uh, and Facebook and uh, uh, all these bad apps in China without using VPN. And I, I was wondering how is that possible because under Chinese law, it is illegal to browse all these uh, websites which are banned in China. But I think, uh, you know, there's a good chance that uh, this app is sanctioned by the Chinese government. And uh, this might signal that uh, the Chinese government uh, is now uh, reconsidering its approach to uh, internet uh, uh, blockage. And maybe uh, we will see a new era upon us. Maybe, you know, the uh, side effect, uh, the positive side effect of the TikTok and WeChat ban is that the Chinese uh, government now realize that uh, uh, bans do not work. And if they start banning other people, uh, the other people would also ban them. Maybe they will start to lose up and maybe we will end up in a better world. Thank you. Anna, I mean, that was so positive and uplifting. He took mm -hmm. all of these uh, scary ideas and words like Pandora's box and he showed us there might be a silver lining. We might realize that just hitting each other is gonna to lead to nothing and we might wanna be more open and connected. I liked your vision um, of, of this global interconnected world and I do appreciate that you're saying we need to have uh, some, some global rules if we wanna make this work and, and maintain an open internet. Um, Anna? Yeah, no, I um, I appreciate the uplifting vision. Um, I absolutely agree with the other speakers that um, there are, you know, really pressing concerns about data now that touch on an array of issues, national security, consumer protection, freedom of speech, our ability to operate um, elections independently. And, you know, the volume and importance of data has just increased so much that it's clear that this is just a much more pressing issue than it was a few years ago, and that will only increase. Um, there is, you know, some recognition of that in the United States and Congress. Um, for example, you know, Congress re revised the CFIUS rules for reviewing nat national security transactions a few years ago to include data, which is why TikTok came under this national security review in the first place. Um, but I think, you know, we still have an issue where a lot of members of Congress, a lot of people in the administration don't, you know, use TikTok, don't understand what the service is and are trying to um, create uh, regulations for it. Um, I mean, in, you know, in general, I, I just agree with the other speakers that this global system of rules um, for data is still just very much under negotiation, very much in flux. And I think, you know, especially in the US, we definitely need to have more of a national conversation about what kind of more comprehensive approach we're going to take. So, you know, if there's an upside um, to the TikTok WeChat saga, maybe it's that it will help to accelerate that kind of conversation. I want to thank everyone for uh, such an enlightening, enlightening conversation, and thank you for ending it on such a um, uplifting, uplifting note. I, I know that I've learned quite a bit from uh, the panelists today. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank um, the uh, Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub and all the other sponsors for doing this. I am uh, realizing, uh, as with most uh, data, um, as with most issues that deal with the digital economy, our Technology is ahead of where our regulation and our rules and our international agreements and commitments and discussions are. And uh, we just hope that the, the potential negative ramifications are either addressed or we can get ahead of them. So I look forward to um, here, seeing what happens with this. I hope it ends up in a positive way. Um, we will see what happens with litigation. This is an ending and the saga continues. I wonder what the season finale will be, I guess, on Netflix or what the series of trilogies or books are. But until then, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, again, thank you to our speakers. <laughs>